Okay, welcome everybody. It is Wednesday, October 13th. Um, it, this is the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series, and today we are talking pheasant hunting. Uh, Matt, if you want to get your presentation up and running, that'll be great. Um, and I'm going to unmute you. Uh, with me today is Matt Lee. Matt is a member of the Minnesota chapter of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, which is a local conservation group. It's a nationwide conservation group with a local chapter, and, and Matt is part of that. Um, and and um, yeah, Matt, if we could get to the beginning of the PowerPoint. Well, not, oh, sorry. There you go. There we go. All right. Uh, right now we've got about 42 folks on the call. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. If you didn't tune in uh, while the welcome slides were going, we do have a chat function. Uh, there's a Q&A function. There's a multimedia viewer in case you need closed captioning. All of that should be on the right hand side of your window as you're looking at the presentation. Um, in the chat uh, are uh, Northwoods spiritual advisor Craig Kiger has put in uh, a bunch of links for a bunch of stuff. We've got our pheasant hunting landing page. We've got our learn to hunt pheasant landing page. Um, we've got uh, our you know broad general information about pheasants in there. Um, we also have uh, the uh, the the licenses for online license purchases in the chat. Um, as we go through the the conversation today, we'll be putting more stuff in the chat. Um, as we go through, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. It's a lot easier for us to navigate the Q&A if you have questions than it is the chat. So with that getting said, um, we'll get started. And if you do need closed captioning, please click on that multimedia viewer. Um, a little warning message will come up. Click the blue continue button if you need captioning. So, um, so let's get started. Matt, take us away to the next slide, please. I, I waited until you were just about to drink something. Um, Really quickly, you know, we looking at the registration information that we have for the series, we have a bunch of people who just tune into one or two two videos or webinars. So I want to make clear about what this is, who we are, what we're talking about today. Um, this series, it's an ongoing series. It's been going since the end of April every week, uh, and we're tackling a range of topics and subjects. So if there's stuff that you're curious about or interested in, um, we're going to be talking about it. Uh, we may have already talked about it, and I'll tell you how to get to that uh, previous information uh, in a moment. Uh, we are, a, you know, a, we're the DNR uh, Fish and Wildlife Outreach Section uh, is the one that is coordinating this. Uh, every week, we typically have different voices with some consistent people that are that are coming through um, every week. So today, it's me and, and Matt. And we're talking about pheasant hunting and, and things to consider while, while you're out, out there chasing, chasing ringnecks. Matt, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, like I said, this is a weekly series. Uh, our goal is really for you to learn about hunting, fishing, and the recreation opportunities around you. You have it here in Minnesota. Um, Minnesota is, is tremendously fortunate to have, I, I don't know the appropriate unit of measurement to convey how many opportunities there are it is a boatload it is a pants load like i don't i don't know i don't know what the, the 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 best way to put it but it's a lot there's a lot of opportunity we have here in minnesota and um we're just trying to get people information to get out there and engage with it coming up next week we're going to be talking about bats of minnesota which is a very appropriate time to be talking about about it as we come into the end of october and, and halloween right around the corner um and then October 27th, we're going to be talking about con uh, chronic wasting disease with some of our wildlife health experts. And then it's deer. Like the next the next three weeks are, are just deer, deer, deer because deer opener, the firearms opener for deer hunting is coming up. So we're going to be talking about CWD. We're going to be talking about deer opener. We're going to be talking about hunting with a muzzle loader. And then we're going to shift a little bit to, you know, how do you create wildlife habitat in your woods? Um, and then some stuff about nature. Rx or prescri prescribing nature engagement for, for, for folks. So that's some of the stuff that's coming up. Um, for more information about this, and if you want to register for these upcoming talks, just do a quick search for Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship. That'll bring you to our to our webpage. It'll also have all of our previous videos going back to, to, to the end of April. Matt, if we could move forward, please. 
Maybe. <laughs> there you go. All right. I am James Burnham. I'm the Recruitment Retention and Reactivation Coordinator for the state of Minnesota. Um, that's a long title for basically my job is to get more people out hunting and fishing. Um, I've been doing this since December of 2017. I am very excited about this talk because I did not hunt pheasants until I came to Minnesota. So I'm an early adopt, like I'm an adult onset hunter for pheasants. I, I'm, I'm late to the game with pheasants, but I'm early in my development of pheasant hunting. So um, this is very much going to be me asking Matt a lot of questions and hopefully they're relevant, relevant to you um, if you're also interested and curious about pheasant hunting. And Matt, you muted yourself somehow. I got you. Go for it. Hopefully, I'll have some relevant answers for you. I thought I unmuted before I started talking. Uh, I'm Matt Lee. I'm the current chair of the Minnesota chapter of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. We're a public land access organization. Uh, well, there's several out there that uh, focus on species specific issues. We focus on the land and the waters that we hunt and fish on. So uh, go ahead and check us out at backcountryhunters.org. Uh, you can get a hold of me at uh, Minnesota at backcountryhunters.org as well if you have any questions after this presentation. Um, otherwise, I uh, grew up in Northwest Iowa. I've been pheasant hunting since I was eight years old. Been a resident of Minnesota for 30 years now, I suppose. So um, I've done a lot of lot of pheasant hunts here, and uh, most of them have been in the state of Minnesota. So there's plenty of birds to be had here. That one there in that picture was taken uh, in West Central Minnesota. And, uh, I think I was still in Lac Paul County when I found that one. So um, other than that. I've got a lot of years of experience. I am not a biologist. I don't have all the technical information that uh, one might be looking for on birds, but uh, I've got a pretty good idea of where they hide out and uh, where they're going to jump in front of you when you're out there on the on the hunt. So that's awesome. And that. one of the things, one of the things that I really like, Matt, is that you and I kind of came um, at things opposite, right? Like I grew up deer hunting and I came to pheasant hunting and you grew up pheasant hunting and came to deer hunting. Is that, is that fair that to say? Is, yeah, that's a fair statement. Um, I didn't start deer hunting until I was, uh, on my late thirties. And, uh, once I got out deer hunting, I realized how much extra information I had picked up on deer because I was using deer trails to move through cattail sloughs and things while I was out pheasant hunting. So it was pretty easy for me to pick up on areas where deer move through other critters for that matter, but uh, it's it, it's a great opportunity to get outdoors to see what's going on with wildlife, and uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, commit some mistakes, learn from those mistakes, and then not have to wait 12 months to uh, try again to fix that mistake. So that's, that's one of the things I love about pheasant and small game hunting in general is that there's a lot more opportunity than uh, the one and done opportunity you have with deer. So nice. Nice. All right. Well, let's 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 move forward. Um, I'm going to I'm going to jump in here and talk about pheasants in my previous life. I studied birds. I'm kind of a bird giant bird dork. Um, and, uh, you know, pheasants are there. It's it's a. There's a lot going on with pheasants. Um, the pheasant that we're talking about, there's a, there's a range of species of pheasants, and I'm not going to delve into the taxonomy or or the the fights that the geneticists are having with how they're lumped and grouped and related to one another because that would probably put most of you to sleep, but maybe a couple of you would get fired up about it. Um, but when we talk about pheasants, especially here in Minnesota, we're talking about one specific species, the ringneck or common pheasant, um, Phasianus clochicus. And uh, originally that was, you know, the, the natural range, the quote unquote natural range for the pheasant, the ring neck pheasant is in Asia and spread from Japan all the way to as far west as the Black Sea. And the species name for the pheasant, Clochicus, um, actually references a part of modern day Western Georgia, the country, not the state, um, the country of Georgia that is on the, East coast of the Black Sea, so that's the region. That's spe that's a specific region that um, when when Linnaeus uh, named these birds, that, that was the reference because they they were Asiatic. They were an Asiatic bird. Um, they were widely introduced across Europe as a game species from starting with the Romans. I mean, people have known that pheasants are a fun to hunt and b really really tasty for a long time. 
So the Romans did a really good job of, of spreading pheasants across Europe, even bringing them to, to England, um, where they've been for several hundred years, um, probably pushing a thousand years at this point. Um, and when the colonists came over here and settled the US uh, from Europe, um, the, they, they brought birds with them. They were one of the first things that they brought in. In fact, the first attempts to establish pheasants predate uh, the formation of, of the United States. Um, but an established community of self-sustaining population didn't really exist until 1881, and that was actually in the West Coast in Oregon. Um, they came to Minnesota in 1916. Our first hunt here in the state was in 1924, so we're coming up on the on 100 years of hunting pheasants here in, in Minnesota. Um, and there's a lot of variety to these birds uh, that are typically identified by the plumage patterns. Some of them have those bright white um, ring necks. Some of them don't necessarily. Um, some of them have like white mohawks on the top. There's a lot of color variability based on the specific region that the, that the original breeding stock came from. Um, but for the most part, they all kind of have that, that very typical pheasant shape. They're red on the face for the males. Um, there's a difference between the males and the females. There's sexual dimorphism going on here. The males are very, very colorful. They're very, very showy. They have that really, really long tail. Um, and the females are not at all. They're very brown. They blend in really well uh, to their surroundings, which helps them as a ground nesting bird avoid predators. Um, if they were, if the females were as brightly colored as the males, they wouldn't do so hot um, hiding on a nest on the ground. Um, and then that bottom picture is one of these kind of confusing um, um, phases that the males go through. So that's a molting male bird. So it's it's missing that really long tail. It's missing that characteristic green neck and the ring neck. But you can see those breast feathers coming in. You can see the red developing around the eye. That is a young of the year male that's getting that's growing into their uh, that's molting their their adult feathers out. Um, so when we're talking about hunting pheasants, we're really restricted to talking about only males taking only males as when we're out in the field or roosters. Um, the males are bigger, they're more colorful. These are birds that are about the two to three pound range. Um, and remember, these are in the chicken family, uh, so they're they're runners first, they're flyers second. They they want to run more than they want to fly, but they will fly. Uh, when when they when they feel like they have to, so um, that is uh, that is that, and then really quickly um, the um, that molting once once they molt once the males molt into adulthood, um, that's what they look like. So that's not an annual uh, process. Once they once they've got those adult feathers on for the males, they they've got them to keep. So um, moving forward. Uh, for licenses and regulations, um, you know, make sure you have, when you're going out pheasant hunting, make sure you have a small game license. You need a pheasant stamp. Um, you need one article of blaze clothing above the waist. More is always better so that you are more visible. Um, pheasants are not like turkeys um, where, you know, they have excellent eyesight, but their first tendency, when they see a predator coming, they hunker down. And then the next thing they do is they run. And then the last thing they do is they fly. So it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily need to be um, careful about how you look when you're going out there. You can be, you can be pretty bright when you go out there and, and it helps with other hunters that are out there um, to avoid uh, any accidents. Um, you need a legal means of take, which is a shotgun. Um, you are allowed to hunt with rimfire 22 ammunition. So that's short, long or long rifle. And that's on page 42 of the regulations book. Um, it's a good idea to have walk-in access validation because that's going to open up a lot of areas for you uh, to go hunting that wouldn't otherwise be available. But that is a separate thing that you need to purchase. It's about $3 and it's really easy to get and it's a great program. And we'll have a link to that in the chat. There's also a donation feature to that. So when you are getting your license, be careful to specify that you want the validation and not just the donation. Um, Absolutely. Also, if you feel like giving a donation, I would encourage that as well. Uh, I've hunted a lot of the walk-in access stuff, and it is a lot of times just really good habitat. So it's uh, yep. good to get more of it whenever we can. Yep. All right. Um, the season limits. Uh, Matt, did you want to take over on this one? Or? Sure. 
Okay. Sure, no problem. Yeah, with seasons and limits, uh, there's one little uh, catch that came in Minnesota. I want to say it was around 2010, maybe a little earlier. But uh, the typical season runs from about mid-October to just the first Sunday after uh, New Year's Day. Uh, that extension happened with the change in regulations as well. It used to be till December 31st, but now you can. So this year we can hunt from October 16th through January 2nd. Daily limit from October 16th through December 30th is two roosters. And then on December 1st through the end of the season, it goes up to three roosters. Uh, the possession limit, which is the total number of pheasants you can have at home in the freezer, is six for the first uh, half or through December 1st. And then after that, it jumps up to nine roosters. So uh, be careful, be cognizant of that. Know your date. If you're only going to hunt two, shoot two in a day, that's fine. Um, I don't know a whole lot of late season hunters that really limit out, especially in larger groups. By the time December rolls around, the pheasants are pretty well educated on what's happening. So the other thing is in Minnesota, the hunt starts at 9 a.m. and you can hunt till sunset. If you do, do leave the state to hunt, be careful to check those regulations because they do vary state to state. Iowa is 8 to 4.30, South Dakota first week or so starts at noon. So uh, just pay attention to the regulations as always if you're hunting anywhere other than Minnesota. But this is what we got going on here. 16th to the 2nd, two roosters till the 1st of December, then three roosters, six roosters in possession. And January or December 1st, you can take nine roosters home or have nine roosters at home, excuse me. Um, one of the reasons I like pheasant hunting is it's super easy to get gear and get up and go. Uh, all you need is a shotgun, and uh, in the two pictures I've got posted there came out of my basement stash of, of stuff. Um, you got boots. I got just a look, just got an old pair of hiking boots that I have that uh, I wouldn't necessarily wear, but if that's what I got, that's what I'm hunting in, right? Uh, grab a pair of durable pants. A lot of the areas you walk through, blue jeans are plenty durable. Um, if you have something that's double-faced, it's nicer. The pants I have below actually have a tighter weave, that little... Uh, brown patch on the thigh there runs all the way down to the ankle and those pants are designed to uh, keep briars from poking through and poking your legs and whatnot um, otherwise as far as shotguns go i know people that have hunted from 12 gauges all the way down to a 28 gauge um, i started out with a uh, single shot bolt action uh, 410 that i was loaned which was a great way to get started uh, with one shot in the gun You've got to slow down, take your time, and make a good shot, which was uh, it's a good way to learn. Um, otherwise, typical shot size you're going to want to use if uh, you're using shot is four to six. Um, that's listed on the box if you're not familiar with shotgun sizes are. Uh, it's basically, oh, I can't remember what determined the shot size on it. But uh, anyway, four to six is on the box. And, uh, well, four, five, six are the ranges I would recommend. Non-toxic, if you're going with steel, steel runs a little bit lighter than lead. So people tend to up the size a little bit and choose size. Uh, yeah, like I normally shoot size six for pheasants early in the season. And uh, with steel, I'll shoot a size four. Occasionally I might have some twos, but that's not very often. It's just, just so happens to be whatever I have for duck hunting is typically what I use for pheasants. Now, now, just a reminder there, um, Matt, when everybody, when Matt says you go up in shot size for the non-toxic for the steel, that actually means the number is smaller. So yeah. the, in shotguns are, are flipped. Um, so the, the higher the number with a shot size, the smaller in diameter, the pellet. So the smaller the number in shot size, the bigger the diameter. So when, when Matt's saying go up, he's talking about the diameter of the pellet. Yeah, I'm th specifically talking about up in the size of the shot. Uh, four is larger than six, for sure. Um, other than that, dual, durable pants. You can see in the picture on the upper left there, I've got a hat and just a, that's a cheap $1.99 blaze orange vest you might find at a hardware store if you forgot to get bring your blaze orange out for deer hunting. But it's blaze orange. It works just fine. I don't have anything to carry pheasants in that first picture. They're not super heavy. You can carry them in one hand and drop it if another one flushes and then shoot that bird and go pick up your next one. In the lower picture, I've got a pair of gloves, which I uh, I almost always hunt with gloves on my hands, either, you know, pushing weeds out of your face or willows or uh, just a lot of things that can grate across your hands and make them 
you know, tear them up a little bit. So I like to wear a pair of gloves. I've also got a, a vest over there that's got a little bit of back support in it when I put it on and hold. It'll hold four or five birds and still be walkable. It'll also hold a uh, water bladder. I tend to walk with that. When I had a dog, um, my dog was able to drink from my water bladder. And then the blaze orange hat, a little more durable of a shirt with uh, blaze orange patches on it to make myself more visible. But I definitely recommend going above the minimum requirements for uh, for blaze orange. Um, squirrel hunting is a little bit different in the blaze orange you might choose because they have pretty good vision and they'll go hide. But with pheasants, like James said, your your goal is to get them moving. Um, they have a tendency to hunker, run, or flush, right? And when you walk up to them, they'll eventually flush. So. Moving on to the next slide, I think here. Um, where to hunt? We've got lots of options in the state of Minnesota. We've got wildlife management areas. We've got waterfall production areas. We've got walk-in access. We've already talked about wildlife refuges. A lot of those will allow hunting. Um, and then there's private land. When we're talking about wildlife management areas, and you can see on the left side here, we've got the uh, pheasant range in the state of Minnesota and the densities, projected densities for 2021. Um, I spent a lot of time out in the far west side of the state, La Caparo, Yellow Medicine, um, a little bit of Big Stone and Swift is where I've done most of my pheasant hunting in the state. But I have seen, I've seen pheasants up near Mille Lacs on the northern edge of that range, and I have seen them um, driving back and forth along uh, I-94 up in Ottertail County. So get out, get where you can. I've hunted plenty of pheasants here close to the Twin Cities as well. Um, wildlife management areas are state managed areas. So you're able to use uh, lead or steel shot when you move into federally funded lands like waterfowl production areas. The federal uh, requirements are for steel shot or non toxic shot, I should say. So make sure you're, if you're out in those areas hunting pheasants in a waterfowl production area, you cannot have any lead shot on you whatsoever. You can have it back in the vehicle, but you can't have it on you in the field. So a lot of folks, um will just shoot with non-toxic shot to begin with um, i'm sure james later i'll talk a little bit about what uh, toxic or not lead versus non-toxic shot means to the birds and uh, predators that prey upon them um, walk-in access is a private land uh, easement that the state of minnesota started a few years back it is a fantastic program um, I encourage anybody to reach out to their legislatures and tell them how much you love it. If you've hunted it or used it, let them know that we'd like more of it so they can get more money to the DNR to use for that type of easement. Um, access is the number one reason that people struggle to uh, continue hunting or even start. Um, if you do have friends or you know anybody that has farm places with good habitat, uh, private land is great. Reach out, ask them. Um, you can also find these places by uh, using the internet. The DNR has the Recreation Compass, which is a fantastic resource. It'll easily show you the uh, uh, WMAs, the WPAs, and also they publish, I'm not sure if it's the state or if it's counties, but there is a walk-in access book that's published every year. It's a paper book. The great thing about that walk-in access book, if you can get your hands on one, is not only does it have all the walk-in access, it actually has all the WPAs and WMAs on it as well. So that's a great one if you're out in, in the hinterlands of Minnesota. Sometimes there is not great cell phone service, so your apps may not work. There's several uh, commercial apps out there that are available. Um, those commercial apps can provide the land ownership. If you got private land that looks like it's got some good habitat and you want to get a hold of the person that uh, is listed as the uh, registered owner, um, those phone apps can provide that information to you as well as the uh, County's got uh, geographic information system information on their websites usually. Um, I know I looked briefly the other day, Lac Paro, Yellow Medicine, both of those counties have that available. Um, otherwise, you can go into the county office and get what's called the county plat book, which is uh, just printed out maps of who owns what and where. The county keeps a registration of all that for tax purposes and you can use as a citizen, you can access that public information and find out who owns that land and reach out and Ask them if you want to hunt or if you can hunt their land. Sometimes you'll get a yes, sometimes you'll get a no, sometimes you'll get a don't ever call me again. But uh, I encourage everybody to reach out and ask about the opportunity to hunt on people's land. So 
And um, I went ahead and put some links in the chat for the walk-in access, and you can get that atlas uh, that Matt was talking about that's downloadable uh, on that site. Um, it's downloadable now? Yep. Yeah, nice. we're living in, the, living in the 21st century. Um, so it's, you, can get, you can get that information at the walk-in access site. I also put in a link for the Recreation Compass so that you can um, click on that and get a really nice interactive map of all the public lands uh, around the state. Yeah, I don't know if y'all have changed the walk-in access, um, or not. Sorry, not the walk-in access, the rec compass. But I used to have it set up as a link to the web page on my uh, my phone. It's not actually built as an app for the phone, but it actually works pretty good as long as you have internet coverage. Yep. So, uh, let's see. Moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about methods. Um, I've got several photos here, and these photos were actually chosen specific to uh, what I'm going to talk about here. Um, one of the big things, especially if you have a dog, is to hunt into the wind. And uh, it's not necessarily important to have a professionally trained dog. I will say this, I've got a, a mutt mixed dog here that I've been working with a little bit of squirrel hunting and I've taken him out pheasant and grouse hunting. Um, he listens well enough that he stays within range. So if a bird flushes, I'll be able to shoot over him and shoot that bird. And he's just a fantastic little companion to have out in the field. So don't think you have to have a, a professionally trained dog. You just need a dog that will listen. Um, recall when you call them to heal. There are things you want to make sure that they stay away from out in the field. So you want them, you want them to have a strong recall. When you call them back, they'll come back to you. Um, so one of the things, hunting into the wind is not just for the dog. It helps the dog a lot. But as a hunter, what will happen if as the winds increase and you push a pheasant into the air, they will almost immediately turn downwind. And uh, so if you're already hunting downwind, when they leap to fly away, they accelerate very quickly. Um, if you're hunting into the wind, there's a brief pause moment of acceleration they have before they can get enough speed to start a turn and then turn downwind, crosswind or downwind and uh, fly to safety is what they're usually going for. Um, if you look at that picture in the upper right, that uh, looks, you can see where that bean field comes adjacent to the grass. That dog's working that edge right there. It also looks a lot like what a fence line would look if you have the opportunity to hunt one of those. As a hunter by yourself, that's a really easy opportunity for you to get out. The birds will hunker down and then flush just about as you get to them. Sometimes if there's enough space for them, they feel safe enough, they'll run to the end of that. So with that being said, you always wanna walk that type of habitat to the end all the habitat to the end with it, it stops and makes that transition from grassland over to bean field, like you can see there, or cornfields, corn stubble um, is a great way to do it. The other thing you'll find as you're walking any of this habitat, if you're pushing birds and there's a slight uphill, as they get to the top of that hill, they might actually flush there rather than go run down the backside and continue to run. It just seems that little bit of rise sometimes will, will give pheasants the opportunity they they need to get in the air and get away. Um, where are we at? So that being said, those hill, hill rises, habitat transitions, you can kind of see this picture in the lower left here. Um, three hunters working this field together. They're in some pretty thick habitat in here. This grass is pretty heavy. There's some transitions coming here, a little bit of transition area here, and then off to this hunter's left, there's a transition as well. A lot of those breaks in the habitat where it goes from tall grass to short grass, birds will flush. Um, so you kind of want to walk, if you're walking with a group of hunters, you want to stay even with one another. You're shooting birds that flush in front of you. Um, each, each hunter basically has the little 45 degree sector in front of themselves. That's they're responsible for shooting the birds that go in there. Um, you don't want to shoot down the line of hunters for those of you that haven't hunted pheasants before. Um, give everybody an opportunity to shoot the birds that jump in front of them. You'll get your opportunity, I promise. Uh, as far as uh, other transitions, you'll look here. I'm standing in this bottom middle picture. There's a cattail slough here that I'm looking at the edge of. On the far side of that, you can see that grass over there is really very short. So this transition from this tall, thick grass to this cattail slough, a lot of times you'll get birds to flush there. In a dry year, this might be when I would find one of those deer trails and just walk through that slough and push them up. And I'd expect them to flush at the edge, far edge here. A lot of times, sometimes they'll flush in the middle of this. Um, if you're hunting without a dog and you're hunting in this heavy cover, take your time with your shot and make a good shot. 
because uh, pheasants are a durable bird, it seems. If you hit them with only a few pellets, a lot of times they'll go down and it looks like they're going to be down, but they'll hit the ground and they'll take off on it. And uh, at that point, they're difficult to recover. So, and that just as a just an as a side, um, the handful of times I've been out pheasant hunting, it's a very humbling experience as somebody who's kind of new to it. Um, you know, I've I've had birds that got hung up in the wind and they just look like a, a painting, just like s straight up in the sky. And I I'm, I don't consider myself a terrible shot, but you know, I I I took. I took three shots at this thing and it just kept on going. It, it's, I don't, I don't know what happened. And then um, I've actually been hunting with Matt and I watched him shoot a bird that I was, I would have put a lot of money on the fact that it was a dead bird. I mean, it folded up and just dropped like a rock and we took our eyes off of it for a split second. Cause another rooster flushed and he, he just Kaiser so his way out of our life. He just poof vanished. And um, Matt was like, yeah, that happens. And I was like, that was a dead bird. I mean, he, that was, he folded up and dropped like a rock. And, and Matt's like, yeah, they, they do that sometimes. So they, they are durable. Not, not only that, that bird kind of fell. If you see my pointer here on the upper right, it fell right on the edge of this grass and bean. I saw where it landed in a bean field. And it got up. I took my eyes off it because a, uh, as the dog was going to retrieve it, Another bird flushed next to the dog, and I shot at that and missed, and the dog lost sight of the first bird, and we never found that bird. I, too, thought it was a dead bird. I, I couldn't believe it. It went down hard. So, um, The other thing I would say is uh, if you're hunting with multiple hunters, have one person mark where that bird goes down and stop moving and walk the rest of the people that are going to go try to look for that bird into the area where it is you'll be far more successful if you can have somebody walk you up to the bird where it fell it gives you a far better reference as to where to start looking for that dead bird especially if you don't have a dog and even if you do have a dog a lot of times you want to find that that area where the bird came down first to get that hunt started for that dead bird um so talked a little bit about the fence line type arrangement here there's also a fair number of uh creeks and drainage ditches that run through fields in the uh, in the state hunting the edge of the, those can be very productive um, any area if you're out hunting by yourself or just with one other person any area the the smaller you can get it the easier it will be for you to hunt um, when you get into larger fields it takes a little bit more experience with birds to uh, know where in that field to kind of go target on the next slide I'll talk a little bit more about that but, uh, and then if you have, you know, five, six, seven, eight, I think I've hunted with as many as 12 guys before on a pheasant hunt. You can cover a lot of ground walking 12 abreast. Actually, you probably walk about nine abreast and you'd have three guys on the other end we'd call blockers. Um, that's a little bit more advanced procedure. You got to be comfortable with the people that you're there with and shooting because it can, it puts people at risk for falling shot. So, um, so Matt, when you're when you're talking about being abreast of each other, like what's what's kind of the space between the spacing between folks? And I'm I'm sure it varies, but you know, on a on a general as a general rule of thumb, ah, probably ten to twenty yards. Twenty yards is probably on the outside edge of it. The the more room you give between hunters, the uh, more opportunity older birds have to run between you. And that happens a lot, especially if you're not hunting with dogs. The the pheasants, like they said, they have a tendency to uh, run and i am amazed at the number of times that i've been out late season hunting just me and me and my old dog um the number of times she would start to circle off to the right or the left downwind back behind us and i'd just stop and stand there and lo and behold she would flush a bird that was almost in my boot prints 10 or 15 or 20 yards behind me so <clears throat> that's the other thing when you're moving in those large groups, move along, pause, wait. The birds will get a little bit nervous. They'll think you're on to them, and they'll flush. Um, walk to the end of the field. When you get to the end of the field, maybe 10 yards, 10, 20 yards shy from the end of the field, just stop and stand there for a while, you know, a few minutes even. And you might be surprised at how late birds flush. I've, I've been at the truck taking the shells out of my gun and putting my gun away, and a bird is finally fr flushed at the end of the field. So 
Um, they can be patient. They can be skittish. There's just no telling what they're going to do. Um, later in the season, you're going to want to hunt a little bit more heavy cover. This bottom right corner, that hunter's out in willows. This is along a drainage ditch. The far side, you can kind of see a cornfield over there that's been harvested. But uh, these willow stands, wherever I've found them, I have off. I've pushed a lot of birds out of willows. The, the ground itself, the cover, it gives them a lot of opportunity to run. Um, and they don't seem to fly until they get to the end of the willows. It's hard for them to take off and get airborne in it. So the, if they do flush from this, if it's a longer patch of willows, they're gonna run to the edge and then fly there. So you wanna have somebody walking that outside edge or yourself just walking at that edge so that you have a clear enough shot that you can shoot at the pheasants. Otherwise, walk it to the end, birds will flush at the end and then you'll have a good opportunity there as well. Um, go ahead. There's, there's a couple of things. One, I really like that bottom right picture. You can see how that blaze cap pops out and you can see how much more visible that person would be if they had um, more blaze on their arms and chest. Because you, once you get into that thick stuff, people can disappear pretty quickly. So uh, again, more more blaze is usually better than less. The other thing uh, that I that I really like um, uh, about that comment is that you know when you're out there working this stuff as a new hunter, you know. If if you've got dogs in the field, and, and we had our we had our bird dog uh, webinar last week with with uh, with a lot of great tips, um, but if you're out as a new pheasant hunter, you know just a couple of bird dog etiquette things to talk about. One, um, you know don't give commands unless the handler or the owner tells you it's okay or, or or tells you exactly what to say because you know that dog's been trained to work in a certain way. And the other is you know. Typically, the etiquette is you want you want that bird to be above the horizon before you take a shot, um, because otherwise, depending on how your your pellets are going, uh, you could run risk to to cause injury to to an to a to a dog. So you want to make sure that 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 bird is up in the sky um, to be safe and and to make a good shot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's easy to keep an eye on one dog if you're out there hunting by yourself or just a few people and a dog. But the more dogs you have, the harder it is to keep track of them all. I've been out in the field with as many as six and seven dogs, and that can be um, melee, frankly. So you really want to just be aware of of those shots, and like James said, take them. Make sure your make sure your muzzle is slightly above the horizon line, or at least above where the habitat you're hunting is, and you'll you'll have a clearer shot. Um, I've been out in the field. I've had shot rain down on me from far distances. It's a little unnerving, but you know, as long as you're wearing glasses and uh, a hat, I haven't really had any. I personally haven't had any incidents with the uh, shot that's been raining down. It's usually just falling out of the sky. And, and while we talk about the weight of it, it's pretty light in the end. Once it's lost all of its velocity, you just don't want to be near it when it comes out of the gun for sure. Um, See, we talked about pheasants and heavy cover in the wintertime. Um, when it snows, this fence line picture again, all of this greenish grass here is going to get packed down and matted. Even if it does melt off, there's going to be very little cover for birds here. So they're going to move into this habitat here. This, this even this taller grass will get matted down. Um, so areas that act kind of like uh, snow fences and whatnot, like cattails, sloughs, these willows that will cause drifts to happen behind them, those areas of heavy cover are better areas to find birds in the winter time. Moving on, we'll talk a little bit about uh, where I might hunt. Um, this field was, uh, it's a waterfowl production area in the Southwest of the Twin Cities. Um, for this instance, let's assume the winds kind of blowing this way out of the uh, Northeast. Um, I maybe park down in this area. There's a little bit of a slew here. I hope everybody can see my cursor as it moves. Um, I start out walking this here. This was a farm at a field edge right here. So it's a crop field over there. We're just walking a little bit north. You know, I might slip up and, and catch the edge of this slough. Um, depending on how wet or dry it is, we'll determine how far into this cattails I'll get. Um, then we'll kind of come back and zigzag back and forth through this cover until it narrows down and get back up to this edge here. Start with this clump of cover, move, keep moving north. And then uh, 
through this patch of thicker cover, I'm going to maybe weave back and forth again. And this is if I'm hunting without a dog or just myself with a dog. Um, and then come to the north edge here, there was another field up here. We're going to walk this slew edge here. I would expect that if there were birds out in here, they would have either gone into this area and then flushed on this side or flushed up into this corner. And then I'm going to keep working along this edge here. And uh, some of the birds might have scurried into that. And I would expect flushes to come along that edge because that edge is pretty tight. There's not a lot of room for the birds to run. And that's that's a great uh Great area to be. Hold on a second. Sorry about that. Um, that's a great area to be. If you're a single hunter, you want to confine those birds to an area where when they do flush, they're going to be within range, left, right, or center. Um, you know, a big open area like this down in here, birds can flush kind of wild and they can run around you and run circles around you. That's why you kind of want to, you want to push them into corners where they're going to feel nervous and take to the air to escape you. Um, Coming along here, I'd move around this slough here, staying in the edge here where that habitat transitions from the shorter grass to this taller grass. Keep working through that. All along, I'm moving slowly, pausing every now and then, giving the birds a time to get nervous and, and maybe flighty and take off. I'd keep moving around, work through this little patch here and make sure I come back to work this edge. And then since the wind was kind of coming this way, I'm definitely gonna wanna work this edge of the slough. Most of the birds, if they were if they were to flush here, I would expect these birds to take off to my right, come this way. Um, up here, if I were hunting these birds, this is downwind. They're going to take off either direction or they're going to go straight away. Uh, there's not overly predictable as to what's going to happen there. And even that being said, they're not always going to fly to the right. They might just fly right straight across that slew. In fact, you can see when this satellite passed over, the wind was blowing this way. Interesting. Um, Continuing on through this field, you can see where this old old road came up into this probably an old homestead up here. Uh, I'd keep working through this taller, thicker grass and habitat here up through this. Come along through that old homestead, pass over to this low spot that's got some habitat in it. Hopefully push some birds out of that and then back over to this road and work the edge of this slough. Um, these two circles around this, this is a private private property. That's it's denoted in the red there. And then these two circles are roughly 500 yards from these buildings. Um, the regulations do state that you need to be without written permission from the owner. You need to be can't shoot within 500 yards of um, occupied property. So be careful with that. In my younger days, I lost an opportunity to hunt at a farmer's fields and he had some really good fields because I shot too close to the house once with his wife home. So um, just be considerate in what you do when you're out there. Not only it uh, affects your opportunities, but it can potentially affect the opportunities of other hunters down the road. So um, that's why I moved this way through this field here. James, go ahead. No, I, I just, I, I wanna, like, I, I love this slide because everything that you just talked about, you, you didn't use the words pinch points or funnels, which is what I use when I'm talking about deer hunting but you just described pinch points and funnels and habitat mm -hmm. transition and that that habitat transition that's going to work for deer it's going to work for pheasant it's going to work for turkey it's going to work for walleye it's going to work for bass you know getting on the edge of where you have a dense patch of something whatever it is whether it's potamogeton in the water or alder thickets up, up in the forest or whatever like find a thick patch and work the edge of that because if it opens up to something else that that transition is where you're going to get places where animals are going to bed down versus where they're going to be out roaming around looking for food and and that 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 works for a, a wide range of species it does um i've actually never hunted this field i've hunted this uh area to the west over here one time it was a cold windy day and we decided to call it quits after we didn't flush any birds over here had we driven another half mile, I would have seen all of this and I'm like, oh, maybe we should go hunt this, but we didn't. So, yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, activities. yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you, it's that stuff you got to juggle. Um, but that, that whole thing about, you know, the open water, the sloughs, pheasants love cattails, but they're not, they're not water birds. They're not swimmers. So, um, you know, pushing them up against that kind of hard wall of water, which 
they're not going to want to run it. They're going to want to fly it and they'll, they'll pop out and that'll be a great place to get them. And then, like you said, um, just working those transition zones, working the, working the thick stuff. Now, really quickly, you know, what's to the North and to the East of here. Is that, does that influence your decision? Uh, yeah. So this is, these are crop fields. It got cropped a little tight. Apologize for that. Um, but yeah, they were crop fields to the North and to the West. And so, um, depending if it's harvested or unharvested, if it's unharvested corn on the North, it's almost pointless to walk here. Right? That north edge, yeah. This north edge. If 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 the corn has not been harvested up here, or even on this side, if the corn hasn't been harvested, because that's a, a transition, a habitat transition that's advantageous to the bird, significantly advantageous to the bird. Even a bean field, they can get into it and be gone. But the amount of space they have to run in cornfields, um, I have dozens, dozens of dogs I have seen we'd step out of the car with the intent to hunt a cornfield and young dogs in cornfields are challenging. They will catch bird scent. The bird will take off down the road. The dog will be able to see that bird and take off down the road with that bird. And as the hunter, you'll be standing there at the car watching birds just flushing left and right out of this, <laughs> this stand of corn. And you're like, Oh my God. So, um, Sandy corn gives pheasants an opportunity to, to do what they want to do best, which is run. And they will run away from you. Now, that being said, narrow strips, maybe depending on how many people you have, 10 or 15 rows wide, if you can get permission to hunt that standing corn, have one person walk down the middle of it and the other people on the outside edges, you will get opportunities for birds if there are birds in the area. And when you get to the end of those corn rows, hold on tight because those birds will flush and they will flush in abundance. I have been in cornfields when so many birds flushed that nobody hit anything because nobody knew what to shoot at. Um, that being said, that's another good note for yourself. Pick a target, focus on that target and shoot at that one single bird. I know when a bunch of birds get up at one time, it's really hard to focus. So uh, moving on, what are you gonna do when you shoot them? Well. There's options. We can pluck it. We can skin it. I know some folks that just breast them out, which I think is a really sad opportunity. They're missing out. Um, this slide shows our Thanksgiving dinner from 2018. That's a pheasant I shot and decided to pluck. Um, I'll either hang them for a few days if the temperature's outside or in the 40s, and then bring them in and dip them in some hot water and pluck them. Or I've had a lot of success really plucking freshly shot birds like get back to the car within 20 minutes of the bird having been shot and pluck that bird and the feathers seem to come out real quick and real easy. Um, there's a French style of cooking that I forget what it's called, but you start with a really hot oven, like 450, 500 degrees, put the bird in there for about 10 minutes, and then you set the oven back to 250 and leave the bird in there while it cools. Sometimes with pheasants, you wanna take it out a little sooner and maybe not get all the way down to 250, but you can see I'm using the thermometer there to tempt the bird. But as you can see, I put a little bit of butter underneath the skin and on top of the skin, a pheasant is a very dry, lean meat. So it has an opportunity to dry out if you get it too hot. So if you look here, I did that method where I started out with a hot oven, got a nice crisp brown outside coating on this bird. It held a ton of moisture in it and it was fantastic. And this is what we had for uh, Thanksgiving dinner. Um, I've had success smoking pheasants. Um, a lot of times I'll Sometimes I'll skin a bird, sometimes I'll pluck a bird. If I'm planning on roasting it, I'll choose to pluck it if I'm gonna skin it. Uh, if I'm not gonna roast it or the, the body of the bird was hit with a lot of shot, sometimes it's not as easy to skin the bird uh, simply because the more shot, the more holes in the skin from shot, the more likely that skin will tear when you're in the process of plucking birds. Um, yeah, there's a lot of recipes out there. There's a, uh, or, Pheasants Forever has uh, cookbooks with a lot of great recipes. There's some authors out there. There's a former writer for the St. Paul Pioneer Press that uh, has gotten into cooking and he's got some great books. Um, great recipes, great eating bird. Uh, I've, I've had it as, as done as simply as uh, the breast cut off the breastbone, wrapped in foil with a couple pats of butter and a little salt and pepper and thrown on the grill. That is a fantastic way to eat a nice juicy piece of, of pheasant. I have taken them, 
even a skin leg, I've taken those and uh, uh, dusted them in a little bit of breading and fried them in a pan and then drizzled them with Frank's Red Hot and made little hot wings out of them. There's a lot of opportunities, a lot of ways to uh, cook a pheasant. Just about any way you cook a chicken, you can cook a pheasant. Um, to the right here, it looks like somebody was starting a stew pot here. Um, I've done that as well. Pheasant soup is delicious. Pheasant wild rice soup is really easy to make. I recommend that. I mean, it's just pheasant pot pie I've made. It it, it really is. It's it's, and and it's also like, um, you know, there there was a there was a comment shared with me that um, and and I totally agree with it. So thank you, Julia, for 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 making it. But um, it's they've had Julia's had more people ask. Uh, her to take them hunting after sharing some wild game with them. So it, it's just, you know, people, when you don't grow up with it or you haven't experienced it before, you don't know how good it is and you don't know what to expect. And then when you have it, you're like, oh, wait a second, this is, this is really good. And then on top of it, you get to spend the day outside. Now, sometimes it's work, but, um, you know, tromping through a cattail marsh, chasing pheasants, that, that's a, that's not a bad thigh workout. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's a great. Um, it, it really it's delicious stuff. I mean, it, it's just really good eating. It is. One um, of one of the ways I got a quick quick note that with one of the things I do with pheasants after I shoot them, I might uh, especially if I hit them hard or they got some some bruises on them, I'll soak them in uh, salt water brine overnight before I actually bag them and freeze them. And if you look over here on this picture, um, right here at the leg joint, I stopped cutting my legs and wings off. I break the joint at that joint and then I cut the tendons off. Those rounded bones tend to not puncture vacuum bags. I vacuum bag all my birds. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's, if you're gonna, if you're gonna bag it or put it in a plastic, even in a plastic bag, the air will get in through those little holes in the bag. And if you have it in the freezer too long, you'll get a little uh, freezer burn potential. So nice. one of the that's things great... I do, and I found another technique that's great for uh, pulling the legs off, but you'll have to search the internet for that. <laughs> that's a great tip. We're, um, we're coming up on the last 10 minutes. So let's, uh, let's get to, um, let's get to our Q and a, there are some questions we've got um, really quickly. You know, we put a lot of stuff in the chat for links, you know, the, you can do some search on those as well. That's most of what's in here. Um, if you need to go straight to the pheasant, Part of the small game hunting. It's page four and one of the rules and regulations book. Um, and I'm going to ask Matt to uh, to minimize his uh, his PowerPoint show, and then we can get into the Q and A. Uh, Matt's got a a little prop there for for everybody. But one of the first questions we've got, Matt, is uh, yeah, there's, that's a nice ring neck. Um, see the spur on that one. Yeah, they've got those little spurs. That's how they. That's how they. That's how those males get their their fighting done. Um, from Lance and Matt, um, just curious, do you need a license if you're without a gun and just running the dog? Hmm. I've never done that. So I don't know, to be honest. Okay. Uh, if you're out ru running, I don't know. Well, so you're able to, uh, it's in the reg book. I'm not sure what the date is, but after a certain date, you can actually run your dogs on public land for training purposes. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe you actually need a license to be able to do that. So I would say you probably can. Yeah, the, the, my understanding, this is specified for prairie chickens. Like you have to have a license if you're running a dog for prairie chickens. Um, my understanding is that it's not specified for pheasants. I don't think you would be in, in trouble if you did that. Um, there's a big caveat here. Call your local conservation officer and double check um and make sure because if if they're if you're going to get in trouble you're going to get in trouble with them so reach out to your local conservation officer double check with that question and make sure my understanding is that you would be okay um if if you were if you were just running a dog um let me see we talked about how spread the word um the question the five does the 500 foot rule so when you were talking you said 500 yards yeah. around the house i see that 500, I apologize. Foot. 500 feet and yes the 500 feet does actually apply on wmas yep i can point there are uh there's one wma south of this wind cities i'm assuming the uh landowner made a complaint with the dnr because there are actually signs out that say no shooting beyond this point and it's roughly 500 feet from the house 
Yep. So I would say absolutely that applies. Yep. All right. So those are answered. There was a question in the chat again with birds uh, or with dogs. Um, and yes, our bird dog webinar was recorded. Um, if it's not up yet, it should be up by the end of this week. Um, let me see. Let me get up to it. This was in the chat. Uh, there was a there was a comment about um, seeds uh, with grasses, grass seeds uh, uh, negatively affecting dogs. And there are some dogs that have problems uh, with seeds. Um, and when I say this, you know. Uh, the seeds can burrow into the skin, they can go into the eyes, they can be inhaled into the lungs and cause damage to the to the dogs. The, the specific question was about Canada wild rye, uh, but there are other grass seeds that are out there, um, needle and thread grass. Um, uh, there's, 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 other, there's other grasses that are out there that have, as a part of their structure, they're very sharp, they're pointed, they actually have barbs on them, they can work their way into the skin of the animal or, or into the soft tissue. Um, the best way to avoid that stuff, almost all of those grasses are more dry soil grasses. Um, so if you're worried about uh, encountering those, I would suggest hunting wetter areas. You know, those aren't gonna persist where there are cattails. They don't like wet, they don't like super wet feet. They like well-drained soils. So I would shift my focus to, to areas that are a little wetter, a little damper, and, um, and, and you won't get into um, a lot of those uh, dry prairie grasses that have those really, um, really gnarly seed coverings. Um, let me see. I'm not in enforcement for that next question, but I don't know who's actually responsible for the enforcement on that uh, as far as cutting ditches. Mm. I wish we wouldn't. I wish we would wait until August before that happens so the birds are big enough to get out of the way. Um, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a great question for uh, local area managers um, and, a, and a chance to get involved with um, um, engaging with the DNR at your local level. Uh, frequently, yeah. there are open houses uh, that the DNR hosts, and you can go in and, and talk with them about a variety of topics and, and get involved. So, yeah, I think I think that's. I would also encourage reaching out to your legislator mm -hmm. if, if it's um, that big of an issue for you. Definitely. Can you go out and uh, retrieve birds on private land if they drop on private land? Yes. Um, you're supposed to, uh, the last time I looked at the rules in Minnesota, you're supposed to go out there without your gun and you can go retrieve that bird. But if you are asked to leave that property, you must leave immediately and not retrieve that animal. And that reply, that replies to, uh, that rule applies to retrieving down to game, not just pheasants. Um, all right. Tips for hunting without a dog. I mean, if, if, if I'm recalling what you said correctly, Matt, it's basically just go slow. Go slow, hunt the edges, hunt uh, pinch points. Um, I've had a lot of good luck on old railroad beds. Uh, that's that's a good confined point. And not only that, it's uh, if you're by yourself, it gives you an opportunity to hunt hunt it twice. You can hunt one side of the tracks down and one side of the, the bed back. Uh, don't hunt active railroad tracks. That's not legal, that's trespassing. But if the, the um, Railroad beds have been turned back over to the state and they manage them as a wildlife management area. They're open to hunting. Nice, good tip. Um, right now, our last question showing up uh, from Lance, how frequently would you hunt a field and not see any birds? So how do, how do you balance that? You know, you, you're hitting an area, you, you swear there should be birds out there, but they're just not being kicked up. Like how many opportunities would you be out there for it? Uh, you know, it it it, it would, depend on when I started hunting it, what crops were around the field. Let's say I, I went out opening weekend and hunted a field and I didn't kick any birds up, but all the crops were in that field. I might just keep an eye on that area. And uh, when those crops finally come down, those birds are going to be in that field, especially if it's a field I know I've hunted with success in the past. Nice. Um, and that's, uh, again, like you said at the beginning, that's one of the nice things about small game. You know, you've got multiple opportunities to hit it up. Maybe it's just Based on the surrounding conditions, based on the weather, the birds just aren't getting up at that moment. So, you know, don't don't give up on it. You know, patience kill patience gets you more animals than anything else out there. Well, it, and not only that, it, it's, it's as to the frustration side of it. That's just an opportunity to go out and look for new spots to hunt. You know, yep. uh, there's there's a lot of large pieces of of land that the state has WMAs that have areas that are really conducive to hunting with one or two people. 
Um, it might be a, like that piece that I showed where a cattail slough comes right up to a field, field edge, right? Go hunt that. Um, I hunt a field pretty typically west of the metro that um, the east side of it goes right into somebody else's uh, private land of just a big chunk of CRP, Conservation Reserve Program lands. And you can't go access that, but I have shot a lot of birds walking up to that border and walking back out of that border. Um, nice. So it's just just kind of getting a feel for the habitat habitat in the areas and, and like James mentioned the pinch points. You know if 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 you know you got a field edge that's straight here and you've got a meandering little stream through the field, this little point right in here where that stream and that field edge come together, that's a great place to push birds down into. They can't easily cross that ditch without that watery ditch without flying, and they will fly. So nice. Well, it is it is 101. Um, Matt, thanks so much for 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 sharing your knowledge and sharing sharing your information. Um, it, it's always great to talk about this stuff. Um, we had we had a tremendous we had some great questions. We had some great comments in the chat. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in. Next week we're going to be talking about bats, and then after that it's deer, 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 deer. Well, actually, it's only three deers, but um, it's a bunch of deer coming up after the bats. So. Uh, it's a great time to be in the woods. You know, here in the metro, we've got a front coming through. Stuff's going to be moving um, after this weather settles down. So y'all get out there, get at it, uh, take a walk, look around, do some scouting, um, and then you know, take a take a firearm for a walk in the woods because it's it's a great time to be out there. Matt, the thank you so much. Moving too, so get yeah. out. That's another opportunity. You're welcome. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right, y'all have a good one, Matt. We're going to hop back into the. Uh, Green room, virtual green room.